I'm going to read this 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13 today. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers were under the... Uh, oh, wait. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, yeah, I, I'm in the right spot. I, don't, yeah. uh, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all uh, drank that same spiritual drink, for they drank from that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But, the mo uh, but most of them... With most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you, except, except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And so, Lord, we uh, thank you for your word. We thank you that it's serious, uh, but it's also full of promises. Lord, and so we um, come in seriousness to your promises. Lord, we come in seriousness to who you are because, Lord, there's a one decision we have to make in life. Lord, there's one thing we have to do with our lives, and that is to lay them before you. God, that's what you welcome us to do. Would you welcome us to put our... Uh, hope and our, and our desires and everything that we have, Lord, in your hands and watch how you create good things out of nothing, out of bad things even. Uh, so Lord, we just turn to you now, Lord, looking for your grace, asking for your mercy, Lord, and asking to be built up as, as people who come uh, looking to your promises, Lord, looking to your word, Lord. Just teach us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now hey, you guys can sit down. Um, so, uh, some of you know my father. He used to come here. My, my parents recently moved away. Um, but he uh, is a businessman, right? And he's, throughout his career in the transportation industry, um, he's traveled all around the world. He's done a lot of international business. Um, he has a good story that he, he told me once, and I think it's kind of relevant to what we're talking about this, uh, this morning. I think this was sometime in the 90s. Um, my dad was traveling with a group of businessmen uh, from, a, from a railroad company, and they were being toured around Japan. Um, they were working with a Japanese partner to develop some shipping ports and, and kind of a collaboration between uh, their railroad and, and these, these Japanese um, transportation groups. Um, and the group came to one of the port cities that they were looking at to invest in, and they got a tour around town, and they were extremely impressed. Uh, they got to have a sit-down even with the mayor of the city. A and in that meeting, my dad's boss was speaking with the mayor about the city. I mean, he was effusive. He was really impressed. He was looking over the balcony from the mayor's office, and he was going on and on about just what a beautiful place it was, how well-developed it was. And this is what the guy said. He said, it's such an amazing city. There's such great infrastructure, such great potential. I mean, great transportation, so much beauty. And, and the thing that blew him away most, he said, all the roads, all the infrastructure, all the buildings, everything is new. How is it that it's so new? And with that, the room went quiet. It got extremely awkward really fast as the mayor, who was a polite guy, explained to him, well, um, it was new because this was Nagasaki, the city destroyed by the atomic bomb at the end of the World War. So everything was new. Kind of an yeah, ugly American story, right? <laughs> it's easy to forget about history. It's easy to forget where we've come from. But in this case, and I think in the case that we're going to look at today, it would have been good to think a little bit, to have a little bit of awareness of what had gone before. Uh, this passage that we're looking at, it, it, it's part of uh, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. Corinth is a city uh, with a really interesting history. Like Nagasaki, it was completely destroyed in 146 BC. The Romans came in and they just raised it to the ground. But then Julius Caesar in 44 BC, he reestablished the city. He made it a, a, a Roman city. And by the time of Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 
this city had become one of the most important cities in the entire empire and really about a hundred year span of time. Um, it was full of money. It was full of culture, education, and of course the worship of Roman gods, that whole pantheistic uh, worship going on. As one commentator puts it, and we can go to the slide, Mike. He's good now. <laughs> Look at that. Roman Corinth, uh, Roman Corinth was prosperous. It was cosmopolitan, religiously pluralistic, accustomed to visits by impressive traveling public speakers, and obsessed with status, self-promotion, and personal rights. Corinth, it was like a first-class city. It had a first-class reputation. And, and when Paul first went to Corinth, he had a really successful ministry there. You can read all about that in Acts 18 if you want, just, just to see about, about the, uh, the ministry that he had. But I think that one thing that's important for us to note as we're coming into this passage is that we're going to go along here. It's that the Corinthians, some of them at least, they were, they were quick to accept the word. He spent 18 months, uh, Paul spent 18 months with the Corinthians upon his first visit, teaching them, doing Bible study with them. And they were good students because they were educated people. They were smart people, right? They were, they were digging into the word. They were good students, quick to embrace the word. But after Paul left, in a very short time, the church really gained, got into some serious struggles. And that's really the, the setting of this letter to the Corinthians. It, it, it started to struggle because, well, these were smart people. These people had lots of uh, instruction in the word, but they had something else going on. There was an issue despite all their intelligence, despite all their wisdom. And, and that's what Paul's doing. He's, he's addressing them about things that they had been, been mistaken in, ways that they'd gone wrong that they didn't even realize were problematic. So let's just jump in. Mike, he begins right here. He says, moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware. I'm just going to stop there for a second. Um, I think what we're going to see right here is that this thing that Paul doesn't want them to be unaware of, it's really just, it's a Bible 101 sort of thing. We read this passage at the beginning, right? Um, and I think that as we read through this passage, most of you probably understood, because you have some biblical literacy, you probably understood a lot of the references here. You probably understood about the cloud and the sea and, 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 and the food and the drink. It's, it, it, it's, it's uh, references taken from the Israelites' exodus out of Egypt. And I bet most of you, even your kids probably down in Sunday school, they understand these references. If you have much biblical literacy at all, you would get these. And if you don't, by the way, awesome. I'm so glad you're here. If, you don't, if you're not familiar with those stories, that's, that's amazing. We shouldn't be a church of people who know everything. Because I, actually, that's sort of the point of the message. <laughs> um, I, I just love it. I love that we can come and we can learn. Um, okay, so these people, they knew this stuff, but I think it's worth pointing out what, what Paul's doing here. Um, they knew them, and if, if, if we knew them, like we can conclude like that they absolutely knew these stories, right? If we're familiar with them, then these people who were constantly reading the Bible, they, they were familiar with these references because they were smart people, people who daily were receiving instruction for, from Paul for 18 months. They were aware of these references too. But Paul introduces this, this passage in, a, in a, it's kind of a peculiar way. He says, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware. I don't think Paul's like being obnoxious or condescending here. Like, cause we could read that. He said like, like you guys should know this, right? I don't think that's what he's doing. But I think what he's trying to do is remind them about something important that they've missed in their familiarity and in their confidence in their own knowledge. See, something happened to this very informed people. If something happens to informed people in general, it's that when we start, we start to think that we know everything. We start to become very complacent and, and think that we don't have any need anymore to reflect on the past. We don't have any need to question what we know because we have everything handled. What happens to, to intelligent people is that they become overconfident. Overconfidence. We live in a, a smart place. I mean, it's like an objective fact. New England is crazy smart and Connecticut is extremely intelligent. I would say our cultural cultures are, though we don't quite have a big city here in Connecticut like they would, but we can all, it's okay, but we'll be fine. <laughs> uh, we, we, are, we are similarly situated, right? Connecticut is, can I get that slide there? Uh, Connecticut is one of the most educated states in the nation. This graph represents um, 
people over the age of 25 with advanced degrees, so master's degrees and higher. And you can see Connecticut, we're in that darkest shade, along with uh, Massachusetts and Maryland. Like one of, the, one of the most educated states in the nation. The next one, please. Um, we're also an extremely uh, wealthy nation. Connecticut uh, ha has, has one of the highest, is one of the highest brackets when it comes to median household income. You know, so we're up there in that darkest blue category. Uh, yeah, along with, with some of the same states, uh, Massachusetts as well. We have an extremely high median income. I know a lot of us would say, well, that's, that's a nice map, but that doesn't apply to me. Um, but, but, I, but, I, but I think more than anything, what I'm, what I'm trying to illustrate is something about our culture and the culture that we live in. It shows us not, maybe not what's true necessarily of our particular circumstances, but the culture that we live in and what's around us. It's wealthy. It's educated. It values the thing that wealthy and educated people value. And these Corinthians, in their wealth and education, in their wisdom, they had grown unreflective. And I think given who we are and where we live, we, ought, we would do well to be cautious. Because it was Paul's desire that they really should just check themselves and not be ignorant. He didn't want them to be unaware. He didn't want them to be ignorant of the blind spots that were in their lives because they were. They were missing something. And so like a wise man, he holds up to them the mirror of history with the hope that they'll see the danger that they're in because they were completely unaware. So he points them back to Exodus. Next slide there. He says, moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware. All of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Paul, interestingly, he begins to explain uh, what, what happened here to all of our fathers. He refers to them as all of our fathers. We know of the Corinthian church that it wasn't a purely Jewish church. It had a good mix of Jews and Gentiles. And so it's strange that he would say our fathers because we would normally think that that would mean he was addressing people of a Jewish heritage who had those, that, that literally direct genealogical link to the, to the ancient Israelites. But he's not really, I think, in this instance then meaning literal fathers because it wouldn't work for at least half the church. Rather, I think what Paul is referring to is people of the family of faith. He's looking to look, look back at the history of people who have had a relationship with God, this family of faith. These Israelites, he's arguing, they weren't so different. Their history and your history seem to be connected in some way, and you ought to reflect on it. They lived in different times, but they shared this family tradition, is his point. They knew God and had a relationship with him, some kind of relationship. I just point that out because uh, oftentimes I think Christians, we think about the Old Testament. and I mean, what do we call it? We call it the Old Testament. It's not the New Testament, right? We emphasize the discontinuity, the difference between the Old and the New. And there, there are some important difference, differences. Uh, we emphasize how different the life of faith was before the revelation of Jesus Christ and now. And it's certainly true. That following God now is different. We know a lot more about God's plan because we're further along in his revelation. We have the word in a way that, 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 the, uh, that those ancient Israelites did not have. We know who the Messiah is. His name is Jesus Christ. We have access now by faith to his grace. And God's given us his Holy Spirit. There's plenty that I would argue better about the time that we live in and certainly more to our benefit about the life of faith that we have now. But I think we should be cautious because Paul, who was aware of all these things, because he's an extremely smart person, who was very aware, had a good grasp on the Bible, he knew all these things, he still is saying that they can learn something from their father's faith, right? As much as it was before Jesus is appearing. In verse 6, right, he says that these things happened as examples. In verse 11, Paul says that this story is for our admonition. He's saying you can learn something from these fathers, of yours. And I think it would be a mistake to think that their story, because it's so far in the distance, is irrelevant to ours. And Paul's point is that it is very relevant and you ought to be aware of it. Um, I had a, a privilege of going to college with Steph Curry, who some of you may be familiar with. John probably doesn't know who that is. Sorry, John. <laughs> um, <laughs> he is an amazing point guard for the Golden State Warriors, right? And he was like MVP uh, two years ago um, and has been in the final of the basketball, NBA basketball for the past three years. Um, many would say, and no, no scoffing, many would say that Steph Curry is the best shooter of all time. Now, uh, please don't come up to me later and talk to me about basketball because it's just, it's like, like John, it's just not going to work. 
I know Steph, but this is like the lamest thing. I know Steph Curry because we had a music class together. <laughs> That's, that's the only reason, only reason I know who this famous basketball player is. Um, we had a music class. I didn't even know he was a basketball player until about halfway through the semester. And then I said, you're always wearing athletic gear. Oh, you must be a basketball player. Uh, but, but here's the point. Steph became, if you know his story, he became a great basketball player, not because he's so naturally talented, not because he's tall, because he's not. He's shrimpy as far as NBA goes. Steph became a great basketball player because his father was an NBA player. And his father coached him meticulously. And Steph has, um, he just has the most disciplined jump shot around. Uh, and one of the best shooting records. And he became this great shooter because he didn't consider it beneath himself to focus on fundamental things. He just has like amazing form. The same every single time no matter who's in front of him no matter who's blocking him, he just he lines up and he, and he takes a shot that's as much as i know about basketball there right there that's all i know <laughs> um uh so he's constantly focusing as a player on the rudiments of form he's doing extra extra practice i almost said rehearsal extra practice because um because he's, he's working on just just the fundamental stuff he never forgets to keep his eyes focused on the basic stuff my point is this we should not dismiss the Old Testament thinking that because we're so far advanced and we're so intelligent and we have so many things that we can learn nothing from it. We need to learn about some fundamental things about a relationship with God right here. And Paul's point here is that the Corinthians, they had begun to think of themselves as more advanced in the faith, but in fact, they had just become sloppy in the basics. Like LeBron James. No, I'm just joking. Uh, Paul draws out the uh, not basketball. Paul draws out the parables between uh, their situation and the situation of their fathers. Right? He goes on. Can I get that slide, Mike? Thank you. Moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware of all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Paul wants them to see that this story of the Israelites, it was not so different than their own. The Israelites lived in God's presence day by day, right? He, 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 they, God appeared to them in a pillar uh, of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. So they, they lived under the cloud. They saw God and his presence is God's presence directed them from place to place. They followed him around. Is that so different than the way our lives are, are to be lived now? If we're in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. He's in us. He's our counselor, our comforter. A very real manifestation of God's presence. The Israelites, they were, they were it says, baptized into Moses in the sea. And so as Moses led the people out of captivity from Egypt into freedom to the promised land, they were engaged in this symbolic deliverance, right? And that's what, that's what Moses is point, pointing to. Is that so different than our own experience of baptism, right? Everyone here who's in Christ was once in bondage. They were captive to sin, but Jesus has brought us out. He's given us new life. Right? He goes on, he says, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. Here Paul's reminding them of, them of Exodus 16 and 17, when God provided bread from heaven and water from a rock while they were wandering in the desert. And we too, I mean, we have spiritual food. We have Jesus' body broken on our, our behalf, his blood poured out for us, and we are nourished and sustained by his grace and mercy. And in case like the parallels that Paul's drawing out aren't striking enough, Paul says this, they drank the same spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. His point is this, they may not have known about Jesus' name or all that he was going to do, but they had a relationship with God. It was a relationship. They knew God's provision and God's kindness. They experienced God's faithfulness and love as he was with them, meeting their needs, leading them through, trying to forge them into his people. And what happened? It didn't go well. It didn't go well because they neglected the fundamentals. Paul's point is to emphasize to the Corinthians and, and to us, by extension, that we're not so different. And if we're not so different, we need to be paying attention because what does it say at the end? It says, with most of them, God's was not well pleased for their body were scattered in the wilderness. What a perplexing outcome for God's people. Luckily, Paul doesn't leave us hanging right there. He's like, well, figure it out, right? He explains to us why this happened. He goes on in verse 7, uh, slide. Now these things became our example to the intent 
that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Paul explains that like these people, they had this relationship with God, but God wasn't pleased with many of them. Why? Well, because they lusted after evil things. They made this mistake, one that we can learn from, that they lusted after evil things. They made a fundamental error in their relationship with God, one that we could still make today and we ought not to do. I almost wish that Paul didn't use the word lust here. Like, I mean, just, just like in our culture right now, because uh, not that it's not the right word. It's definitely the right word, but because it's a word that in our culture, we've put into a box. We've changed the meaning of it over time. Uh, we think that lust is, is uh, really affecting us exclusively in the realm of sexual desire. I mean, that's, that's what lust means. I'm sorry if I've offended anyone. <laughs> um, let me illustrate this point. Uh, can I get a slide there? Um, this is, if you very carefully Google lust dictionary, <laughs> this is what you get um, <laughs> in 2017, right? Uh, you can't read it. I'm sorry. I, I, I should have checked. It says, uh, the one number one is a very strong sexual desire. Have a very strong sexual desire for someone. So that's the, the dictionary says lust is. Let's see what it was in 1828. In 1828, it was this. Longing, desire, eagerness to possess or enjoy, as in the lust of gain. And then he gives some examples. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. Exodus 15.9, right? Talking about God's longing for his people. Concupiscence, carnal appetite, unlawful desire, carnal pleasure. And number three, evil propensity. Depraved affections and desires, vigor and active power. A little bit more of a robust meaning in 1828 than we've reduced it to now in 2017, right? I mean, what, was, what, what happened is the lust is not just sexual desire. Lust is, is a selfish desire to possess something. It doesn't matter what it is. We, we can lust after lots of things. I think this is really interesting. It's not just that we use a different word for this aspect of lust now. Like a lot of times you go into to old dictionaries and, and you look at words and we, we use, we have different words for the same things. Um, we don't have a word for lust anymore in our culture that's as robust. Anymore. We don't have, we don't talk about our affections and our, and our selfish desires in, in a serious way. And I don't think it's because, because we don't have those anymore. <laughs> um, and I might be taking this too far, but I think it's because we don't believe that our desires can be selfish anymore. We just think, man, if I feel it, if I want it, it must be good. I mean, maybe I'm taking that too far. Okay, let's look at how Paul explains how their lusts played out. Can we get that slide there? Ooh, it's small. <laughs> uh, don't become idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by the serpents, nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for us, for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages has come. See, Paul points out throughout this passage here, three areas where the Israelites were overcome by their lust. First, in idolatry, they had lust, lust after idols, after power, I would say. Second, in sexual immorality, we know that one. Third, and this one is interesting, in complaint and bitterness. They lusted to complain and be against God. Look, we're going to look into each of those and kind of pick them apart in a second. But before we do that, I think it's worth noting that Paul tells us that these things were written down and communicated for our admonition so that we would be warned properly. And he says, and it's especially for us who live at the ends of the ages. Because we live in a time when I think, and I think, again, the changing definition of lust is an in indicative of that. We live in a time that more than ever, where we need to be cautious about our lust because we are more careless as a society. We, we've really begun to think that, that lust isn't a problem, that our, that our selfish desires aren't a problem. We live in a time and in a culture where we are in urgent need of this warning, and we don't even know it anymore. We don't even know that we need to be cautious of these things anymore. Friends, I think we would do well to be cautious of our overconfidence in our own abilities and in, in, in our goodness and in the goodness of our desires and careful to understand the dangers of our own lust. That's what I hope that we can, we can do. Um, and Paul warns them of the same, right? In verse 12, he says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. 
That is quite a sentence. Paul, he's looking at the Corinthian church. He saw a bunch of people who were thinking that they were going to stand up against sin, but who were actually in just an incredibly precarious situation. They didn't even know it. The Corinthian church thought they had it all together. They thought that because of their wisdom, their education, their wealth, their class, you know, whatever, that they were just fine. But Paul is suggesting that they've simply been ignorant of their spiritual state. You just don't know what's going on. You don't understand the lusts that are within you. Remember earlier we looked at some interesting facts about Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut's one of the, the wealthiest states in the nation, one of the most educated states in the nation. We've got a couple other charts here about Connecticut. Connecticut is also the church with, 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 in the area, in New England. I mean, you can see New England in the upper right-hand corner. It almost is disappearing onto the paper. Uh, right? It has one of the lowest rates of, of attendance in church. Um, keep going. This is a really interesting one. This is a ranking of generosity by states. Connecticut comes in as the 43rd most generous or 7th least generous. And then the rest of New England, Massachusetts 47, Vermont 46, Rhode Island 48, Maine 49, New Jersey 50, New Hampshire 51. What's up with us? The least, the least generous people in, in all of the nation. Okay, let's keep going. And I, I'm, not, I'm not, not, not bagging on anybody. I'm just saying, let's, let's be aware of what's going on. Let's be aware of who we are. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is an analysis of people's tweets, state by state, and then analyze to say, are they happy and upbeat, or are they sad and complaining? And you'll see Connecticut, are, look at us. We're pretty complainy, when, at least on Twitter. And I'm contributing to that. I'm sorry, I do like Twitter. Um, so, right, we, we, we are a complainy people. We, we, we are grieving our air, airing our grievances, grieving our errances, airing our grievances online. Okay, one more. I got, this one I find really interesting. Okay, this is a map, and the darker blue is the higher end. It is the, um, oh, what's it called? The benchmark, it's not the benchmark. Happiness benchmark, okay? And happiness benchmark, it's an index of the amount of money a person in, in, says they need to be f maximally happy. Like if they had more money than this, they wouldn't be more happy. And it takes more money in the state of Connecticut and the rest of New England to be happy, maximally happy than in anywhere else, in the except for California and, and, and uh, Washington State. Interesting, $90,000 is what you need to be maximally happy here per year, per year. So. Good luck. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think I'm happy. Um, it's interesting. Look, just interesting things. What's the point? What's the point, right? We can get rid of that there, Mike. Uh, we live in a culture. It is wealthy. It is educated. We epitomize all the aspirations of our nation. But we're also, unbeknownst to us, I think, I think most of us would have been surprised by those things, among the most stingy, Let's be honest, and I, I'm not, not calling anybody out. Like, you guys, can get, by the way, you are super generous. Thank you, Jesus, for this church, for what you guys have done, because, like, oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. I'm not calling anybody out. Um, we are stingy, just culturally, stingy, obsessed with money. We complain. See, Paul warns the educated, wealthy Corinthians to take care because they thought they were doing well, but there were some big problems, big blind spots in their life. They have, uh, they have, because of their cultural hang-ups, been blinded to their lusts and the things that they're worshiping, and the risk was great. Can I suggest to you, and the point I'm trying to make is that our culture is not so different. It's not so different. We need to take heed because affluence and comfort and overconfidence in our own intelligence, it will blind us to what is right in front of us. Paul is pointing out to these believers that there's a problem. The problem is that these Israelites, they were experiencing, and this, the problem is that one that the Corinthians are also experiencing, that neither of them recognized that they were even under temptation. Neither of them even recognized that there was a problem. Neither of them were engaging in this battle that was before them. They didn't even see the lust that was driving them along, keeping them from the Lord. They didn't even know they had a lust problem. They didn't even know that they had set their passions and their desires on things that were not of the Lord. Not even aware. 
I'm sure, thinking about those, those areas where, where less played out in the Israelites, I'm sure that very few of us could say that we've ever been tempted to worship idols, literally, like little statues of, that we ascribe power to, right? But I, but I think that we could all say this. We have all been tempted, and I'll be the first to say this. We've all been tempted to love the things of this world. We've been tempted to follow after worthless things and to build our lives and, and our hopes and our securities around those things. Around those things. The worship of idols is about ascribing power to something that doesn't really have any power. And, and to, to manipulating that, that object of devotion so that we can keep its benefits. Right? We can do this with our bank accounts, with our diplomas, with our homes, with our cars, our relationships, all this stuff that we, that we build our lives around and think that it's our security, but none of it will sustain us. Those things are not worthy of our devotion. I mean, think if you have, if you have a child, think about it. Because I grew up in New England. I grew up in this hyper education culture, like where it's like, man, we have SAT classes and, and, and like, like, I mean, I was out to like 10 o'clock extracurricular activities every night. It's like, I was like working like a 75 hour a week job. <laughs> um, our children, and I, and I, and I understand, I, I don't, I don't want to say this like flippantly, like I understand the pressures that we're at and I understand that there's a balance that we need to strike, right? I understand all that. But our children do not need to worship at the altar of potential. Of potential or of education. They need, before they, they're anything else, they need to learn to follow after Jesus. I could say that's what I needed in high school. And what the Lord, through much difficulty, <laughs> has been teaching me over, over years because of difficulty that I've created. Um, let me ask you something, just as a hypothetical. If you have a child and they decided that they weren't going to go to college but instead they felt that the Lord was calling them to be a missionary, would that be okay? Honestly, I mean, I have three kids. Um, I would be concerned. I would be concerned about that because I was raised in a home, right? Because of the culture that I come from. I was raised in a home where we put education first. I was raised to believe that education opens doors. And to an extent we could say it does. I mean, that's like, that's like not untrue, but I know somebody who opens doors that no one can shut. That's all. That's my point. <laughs> um, I, I, it's culturally true. And I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with education. Please don't hear me bagging on education. I went to college. <laughs> I'm getting a master's degree. <laughs> um, if, but if I come to value something so much that I reflexively reject the possibility that God would ask me to lay that thing down, then I'm worshiping that thing. Right? It's like an alcoholic who says, I can stop anytime. I just don't want to. Right? No, you, you're not going to do it because it has power over you. It has power over you. And I think we can come under the power of things of the, that we would just worship culturally. That idol has been given authority over the Lord. And I think we, in this, uh, me too, I mean, are too often worshiping at the altars of pragmatism and of safety and of keeping our options open. We're in New England, we have a lot of options. Um, we've taken on the values of our culture. And we've lived our lives in worship, um, living our lives in, in, in worship of things that, that aren't worth um, holding on to. We hold on to uh, all these things that are just in the culture. Money, power, prestige, all these things are the gods of our land. And we need to make a deliberate effort to stop worshiping. Because it's just, that's what we do reflexively, instinctually. Because it's in the air. You breathe it in every day. You take it in with your eyes every day, that idol worship. The, and that's the easiest thing that we can do. We, we can look at our idol worship and we can just say, well, that's just culture. That's what, just what you have to do. That's keeping up with the Jones, Joneses. Um, but Paul's point is, if the way you do things is to give your heart over to lust after other gods, then you're doing it. I mean, he's just not leaving a lot of wiggle room there. He goes on, right? He warns against sexual immorality. And I mean, I, I think that we could all, because we're all adults here, we could say that that's a real thing that people lust after sexual immorality, right? Um, but that's not the only place where that battle, the battle for sexual purity is playing out in our lives. Like the battle against sexual immorality is fought every day in the unassuming pursuit of purity of heart and mind. If you want to win out against sexual lust, like, well, obviously, like, we're not going to look at pornography, right? But how about this? How about, how about are we going to listen to music that glorifies casual sex? Are we going to 
engage in lewd conversation? Are we going to get ourselves into rooms alone with people whom we're not married to and whom we have a attraction to? Like there, there, are, there are ways that this, this battle against lust plays out that we don't even know it's playing out. But the battle for purity, it's fought before the moment of decision. Right? That's how we win because we, we've been fighting it before we're actually in the midst of the thick of it. We've been fighting that battle beforehand. But what do we do? I think, I think we think that we can stand, but we should, take, we should be warned. We often delude ourselves into thinking that we can stand against things that we can't stand against. I mean, I, I think going back to, to his example, probably few of us would say, maybe some of us would say it, but few of us would say that we are tempted to complain and grumble. But when, when it comes to our words, um, I think if we, if we were honest, so many of us are just like these Israelites and like the Corinthians. We think that complaining and grumbling is our right, right? Like I've got a right to an opinion because we are smart, right? And smart people have opinions. And by golly, we would be doing a disservice to the world if we didn't, didn't express those opinions. Uh, and that's what exactly, I'm just telling you, that's exactly what Paul is, is saying is happening to the Israelites. I mean, we, we see that played out in Numbers 21. Can I get the slide there, Numbers 21, right? He tells this story about the serpents, right? And, and it happens in Numbers 21, 4 and 6. It says, then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and our souls loathe this worthless bread. That's the bread that God had provided so they wouldn't die. So the Lord sent fiery serpents along the way, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. That's the reference there. It's interesting. In our world today, we think that when we're discouraged, then it doesn't matter what we say. Like, out of discouragement, we can just open up the floodgates, and it's fine, because we're discouraged. I can complain against anyone and everyone when I've been wronged. That's what we think. So I'm just going to speak my discouragement right out. I'm going to just let it spread around. But Paul is explaining that this kind of discouraging complaining, it's just an expression and a manifestation of lust. There's some desire within you and within me, and I'll admit that, that is satisfied when we complain. When we take pleasure in despair, in, in bitterness, and in self-indulging, and in expressing hopelessness. Something sick within us is satisfied. But it's not a pleasure that comes from the Lord. Look at, look at what James 3, 5, and 10 says. Oh, there we go. Uh, See how great a forest fire, uh, a, little, a little fire kindles? The tongue is like a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird or of, uh, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father. And with it we curse men who have been made in similitude to God. Uh, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. We want to believe that our words are innocuous, right? That when we, when we complain in bitterness or in discouragement that it doesn't matter. But James says, it's the opposite. He says, the tongue is so set among the members, like it's such a significant part of your body that it defiles the whole body. It sets on fire the course of nature. It sparks lust and, and it brings things about that ought not to be happening. It's set on fire by hell. Satan, our enemy, can use a complaining tongue to spark a destructive fire in our lives, in our families, within our, in our workplaces, and within our churches. But the issue with all these lessons, I mean, it's the same. Paul focuses on the is issues for a purpose. We so easily forget that we are in a battle against lust. We don't even believe the battle's happening anymore. Can I just say this? Let's be reminded that we are in a fight to fight with an internal enemy, our own lusts, our own desires. And if we don't fight, if we don't recognize that we're in the middle of a battle, we're going to fail. Let's look at verse 13. No temptation. This is a great, great memory verse, guys. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 
we have this great promise from the Lord coming up against our lust, right? Recogn- Paul's recognizing you have a lust problem. Here's a promise of God that will, that will meet you in the midst of that. There's no temptation that we'll face that is so unique, like to your own life circumstances. Instead, he reminds us that this battle that we're fighting, that we're called to fight, is one that all men and women who follow after God have been fighting since, since God created everything. He says this is just common stuff. And we have the same method of fighting. God, throughout all that time, he's been safely delivering men and women just like you who are seeking to honor him and faithfully instructing them and calling them to take the way of escape. Because look, I'm going to make a way of escape. That's the plan, the battle plan. He's calling us to stand. He's enabling us to do so. And your life, let me tell you, your life, can I please, please get that? It is not meant to be a life of defeat, but a life of victory over sin. Because our enemy, Satan, he has all, he's always laying, he's laying carefully devised plans, right? To, to, to bring us down. But God is faithful. He is always making a way of escape that we might stand in the midst of the temptation. Like the Israelites weren't called to defeat. That's Paul's point. His, they, that was not the way it was supposed to go. They were not bound in that, but they were defeated anyway. They weren't called to be objects of displeasures whose body were cast uh, like through the wilderness, like he describes in verse 6. God had for them to live and to live according to faith in him, but they weren't willing to fight the battle. So how do we do that? I mean, just like the final question, how do we do that? How do we fight a battle? Well, I think we just have to recognize that it's going on first and foremost. We, we have to recognize that it's going on and, and, and deal with our lusts. We need to repent of our love for things of this world and instead hold tight to Jesus, to his plans, his promises. And as we remember Jesus' grace, his kindness for us, as we do the work of, of falling in love with him daily, like of cultivating a relationship, that's what we're doing. We're fighting the battle. We're looking to him to make that way of escape from our lusts. Because our, the battle that's going on, it's for our affection. It's for our devotion. It's for what we worship for what we love. And we're called to worship the Lord. We're called to love the Lord, worshiping him, loving him over all other things. That's the battle. You know, Steph Curry like focused on the fundamentals and I think, I think that we just have to focus on the fundamental things. I just look around in, in my own life, right? And especially this time of year. What's my problem? Like where's, where is the thing that's, that I'm most tempted to? The thing that I'm most tempted to, this is just a little bit about me, right? is to just be apathetic. To just be apathetic, right? I mean, when you're apathetic, you're not looking for an opportunity to escape. You're just saying, I'm just going to sit here. I'm just going to ride it out. It'll be March soon, <laughs> right? <laughs> but we have times, guys. We have times right now in a calling from the Lord to just stir up love and good works from one another. We have call, are called together as a church to do that. We're called together to return to our first love. And to keep that first love. I'm not saying that's an easy thing. And I'm not saying I know how to do it that well. <laughs> but I found over the years that it's going to be in prayer and in just deliberately seeking after the Lord. That apathy is, is destroyed, right? Because I lust after being lazy. I'm a lazy person. Just ask my wife. She won't tell you that. And tell her, he said you had to say it. <laughs> so then she'll be honest with you. <laughs> We gotta fight apathy, guys, and especially going into winter, guys. Don't don't retreat. Don't fall back. Don't get depressed. Fight the battle that's in front of you, because God has for us to be victorious. So let's pray. So Lord, I thank you for your word, and I thank you that you're faithful. And God, I pray uh, for my friends here, and for myself, Lord, that we would just have a clear-eyed picture of who we really are, Lord, and the things that we struggle with, Lord. And Lord, that we just stir one another on to pray for one another, Lord, to lift one another up, Lord, and that we would see how you can take broken lives and, and people who are not much to look at, Lord, <laughs> but you can uh, call us to be a royal priesthood, Lord. Lord, uh, ministers to this generation, to this region, Lord. You have us to be people who are on fire for you, Lord Jesus. You don't need us to be different people. 
You just need us to be people who love you. So teach us that, Lord. In Jesus' name.